right. Well, uh, if, if you need a book, Kevin Cleveland's got them. No, I hadn't really thought about it, but uh, I guess if there's somebody that uh, was watching online, maybe one of our members or even anybody that's not one of the members here, and you want a book, we could, if you could write us, we could probably get you one, I'm sure. Um, if you live in the area and you've got, uh, and you're a part of the congregation here, you could probably stop by the building and grab one, but... Um, but uh, as, as far as that goes, we, um, I, I hope that uh, those of you that picked up a, a, a notebook have enjoyed it. Uh, I would like to have, you know, a little bit of constructive criticism. I was trying to do something that was um, kind of a broad spectrum, nice for uh, everybody. Of course, you know, you can't please everybody. But if you do, do have something that you think uh, could have been better, let me know. Um, I'm, I'm open to that because um, if you like it this way, I don't mind. Uh, trying to put some extra effort in doing uh, more stuff like this, but I just wanted to uh, be able to, you know, give you a little extra something for uh, for class. Uh, but uh, before we get started, I've asked Brother Cleveland if he'd lead us in prayer. I think we left off with uh, the language and uh, writing. Do you need a... Uh, the, pictures. the pictures, yeah, they're, they're coming. They're coming. It's a work in progress. I was uh, sitting down to do them today, and I realized that they're on the computer uh, here, and I was at home this morning uh, working. So, yeah, we're going to... We'll have pictures next time. Yeah, so we'll work on that. But as far as... Uh, the outline of the book goes, um, you know, we, we've, you know, there's an introduction, of course, the introduction's uh, seemingly very short. Uh, it's verse, uh, verses 1 uh, through 1, 3, or 4, depending on how you look at it. Uh, but then we get into the superiority of Christ to angels, and that starts in verse 5 and goes through, uh, uh, through verse uh, 18 of chapter 2. And then you have the superiority of Christ to, to Moses and Joshua. And uh, this starts in 3.1 and goes through 4.13 or 4.16, depending. Uh, then you have uh, Christ's high priesthood, uh, chapters uh, 5 through 7, you know, uh, roughly. Uh, Wayne Jackson put uh, uh, chapters uh, 4, verse 14 through 10.18. Uh, I would probably have a little bit of a disagreement with that. Not that that matters very much, but um, um, uh, I, I, I never spoke to him on uh, on that issue. But um, uh, you know, these basic outlines are nothing to to uh, you know to get upset about or anything. But uh, the ministry of Christ as high priest is in eight one through ten eighteen, and uh, then you have some application uh, to readers in ten nineteen. Uh, through 1229, and this is really just a general, these are general things, just applications that can be made to anybody, and then there's a conclusion uh, there in chapter 13, uh, verses 18 through 25. Now, I mentioned last time that there were, uh, we quoted uh, Scroggy in saying that there was uh, no fewer uh, than 86 direct references to the Old Testament in Hebrews, uh, and they are traceable in at least a hundred uh, uh, Old Testament passages. Uh, but also, we have some um, quotations from the Psalms. We have several of them. And uh, Psalm, or, or actually uh, Hebrews one and verse six, it quotes Psalm two and verse seven. And uh, in Hebrews one eight, 
is a quote from Psalm 45 and verse 6 and, and uh, verse 13 of chapter 1, uh, Psalm 110 and verse 1, uh, quoted three times actually in Hebrews. And then uh, two, uh, chapter 2, verses 6 through 8 is uh, quotes from Psalm uh, 8, verses 4 through 6. Now, there are some key words. When you're looking at any book, uh, it's good to know uh, some of the key words because when you see those, you know uh, that this is some kind of a recurring theme. And uh, in the key words here in uh, the book of Hebrews, is uh, one is let us, uh, which occurs 13 times uh, in the book. Uh, the word better occurs 13 times as well. Uh, you know, that's kind of interesting because there's as many chapters in the book of Hebrews. Uh, and then uh, the uh, eternal or the concept of the eternal uh, is mentioned several times. Heavenly is mentioned several times. And perfect is also uh, mentioned several times. And we talked about this a little bit last time. Uh, but uh, when you think about who this was written to, uh, the the book was, uh, you know, of course, we, we kind of... Uh, you know, talked about last time, just thinking that, you know, the, the author is probably Paul. Uh, we are not going to be dogmatic about that. But probably Paul, and he's writing uh, to the Hebrews, um, and uh, that would be, you know, people from a Judaism kind of a background. And uh, they have, these people have evidently, uh, you know, according to what we read, uh, have uh, come out of Judaism and have fallen back, they have become Christians, they've come out of Judaism to become Christians and fallen back in, into Judaism. And so that, that's the basic thought process of what's going on. Um, but uh, you think about uh, this, you know, there, there's a lot of things that, uh, you know, could be said, but when you're looking at the book of Hebrews, there's a couple of things that you need to do to keep Hebrews uh, in the context, and that is that we need to look at uh, the book through Hebrew eyes. You can't look at uh, the book of Hebrews uh, and just think about it in modern times. You know, uh, we, we've talked oftentimes about this. If you're going to get anything out of a book of the Bible, then you're going to have to keep it in the context. The best way to keep it in the context is to try to think as much as you can like a Jew now, that's going to be difficult at times for us because we're not Jews. And uh, I tell you that probably every time I've gone through uh, this book and uh, I've tried to think like a Jew during it, um, I end up finding something else. Uh, and uh, I, I recently came across a, a, uh, a brother in Christ that had written several things about uh, that thought of, looking at it through a Jewish, a Jewish perspective. And uh, I've, I've gleaned from that a lot, and I've, I've added those things to, uh, to my notes, and hopefully we'll uh, be able to do that. There's a lot of good resources out there. I want to kind of point you to, uh, to one of them. Um, World Video Bible School does a good job on a lot of uh, uh, these things. Um, uh, I've only really come to actually watch some of these classes in the last um, uh, year or so, uh, just trying to uh, really, and to really actually to, to be up front, you know, when we started Job, I started watching some of the videos more than I uh, found them to be very good, um, and that's for everybody, anybody can go and do that, and so that's a, that's a good one, um, you know, there's a, a commentaries out there that are good, uh, I know that uh, Tom Waycaster has a good one. Um, Wayne Jackson has an overview, like an outline of the New Testament where he breaks it down um, basically uh, within uh, verse, verses like, um, you know, sections. Like, for instance, in Hebrews 1, uh, verses 1 through 3 is a section, and he comments on that entire section. It's not exactly a commentary, I guess. It's more... Uh, of an overview, uh, but uh, I, I maybe actually is mentioned as a commentary, but it uh, would be uh, more abbreviated. Uh, and uh, so that, that's another good one. Um, uh, there are uh, all, all kinds of good references and uh, resources. Um, anything that uh, I have found in the Brotherhood uh, with the book of Hebrews, uh, I haven't been uh, overall, 
I haven't been disappointed. There have been some things where I think, well, I think they kind of missed the mark in one area or so. Uh, but uh, by and large, uh, I think anybody in the brotherhood that I've read uh, has, has good material uh, on the book of Hebrews. Um, and if you would like some, uh, to you know, get more resources on that, I'll, I'll point you in that direction. So let's go ahead and jump into uh, to the, uh, to the first verse here. Does, uh, does anybody have any comments or questions before we jump right in? All right. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So, you know, let's actually let's go ahead and let's read through a little bit. Let's look at verses 2 and 3 as well. It says, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also... He made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged uh, our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And so let's, let's take this. We're, we're just going to go verse by verse here. This is our first you know, thought. And so God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers, by the prophets. And so this is the beginning of the epistle. We mentioned this last week, but if there was somebody here that wasn't here last week, and uh, sometimes this comes up in the argumentation that, that uh, Paul did not write this because, you know, if, if Paul had written this, he would have attached his name just like he did with his other letters. Uh, but this is written a little bit differently. It's not written like a, a letter. It's not really an epistle. Uh, it's written as a homily that's like a sermon. And so when, you know, you wouldn't expect any preacher to get up and to name off his name every time he got up to, to preach a sermon. Um, if, if that, that uh, sermon is coming from him, you know, if even in written form, uh, you're going to know who it's coming from. You know, we, we're not going to go back and delve into all the things about uh, the authorship here. Uh, but Paul is not identified, and there is no apostolic greeting. There's nothing like that like we normally see. Um, but uh, in the English translations here, uh, God is put right there at the very beginning. And God is definitely the subject. Now, uh, you know, we, I think um, it's interesting, you know, and it's rightly so, of course, you know, when we're translating this to put God right at the very beginning. In the Greek, of course, it is, it is not so because it is not uh, written uh, written exactly the same way. The way that we structure our sentences uh, are, are definitely different. Uh, doesn't mean it's mistranslated uh, because definitely, you know, God is, uh, while God is six words into this sentence, you know, God is the subject, you know, so putting God first is, is definitely the subject of this sentence. It's the, the very thought here. So God is really in the English is placed here at the beginning of the sentence, and, and uh, that is uh, uh, a, a beginning point in which uh, everybody would have, have uh, been on the same page. You know, if you think about it, you know, we talk about trying to convert people and, and uh, trying to bring people from the error of the ways, and, and if you're going up to somebody who's a part of a denomination and you're trying to bring them to the Lord, um, you know, what do you think would be better? Would it be better for us to say, well, you know, I know that we think differently on these things, but, and then go on into something else? Or would it be, it be better to find some sort of common ground and then go from there? You know, hey, I know that we both believe this. You know what? You need to put God first. You need to love God. Uh, let's talk about putting God first. And, uh, and a lot of times when we do those Bible studies, what are we doing? We're, uh, we're setting up some common ground. You know what you got to do? You got to make sure that everybody is on the same page when it comes to authority. If you're not on the same page when it comes to authority, you really can't have a Bible study. So you can't really go on and do much. You've got to really establish authority in the beginning. And, uh, but here you have God, and God is, is uh, right there at the beginning. And uh, uh, I, you know, right, right exactly where, where he needs to be because you know, this has got to be some common ground. But God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, uh, this is this. These are actually really significant words in the original text. 
Uh, when you look at this idea of sundry times, it uh, is, uh, you know, these, these words, sometimes people uh, kind of get them confused because they're very similar in nature. Uh, but, you know, uh, you could look at um, this first word, sundry, the word uh, in the original text for sundry times, you know, means uh, many, many parts, many ways, and, um, you know, progressive in many ways. Um, but if you were to really kind of break this down and try to understand this, and I love the fact that what this word is signaling because it means basically little sections at a time, little little increments, little sections at a time. Um, God did not sit down and say, all right, you know, I'm going to pick one person out. Moses, you, you seem like a good enough guy. Let's, uh, let's just get you to write the whole Bible. I'm just going to tell you what to do. We're going we're gonna to write it down, and this is what everybody is going to say from, from the beginning to the end. It's, it's all right here. You're going to do it. No, he, he, did, he did it in segments. Yes, Moses did write some. You know, you, you have, uh, uh, have, you know, Paul that wrote a, a good majority of the, the New Testament. You have uh, these prophets speaking out and saying different things. Uh, but God gave his revelation in many parts. And sometimes people will try to tear that down, but I think that actually builds up the thought of the, the Bible in and of itself because if he gives a piece over here and he gives a piece over here and he's given pieces out to all these different people to proclaim throughout time and yet they all fit together perfectly, um, that, that is impressive, right? No man could have done that. It would be like saying, all right, uh, we're going to take 66 people and uh, we're, uh, uh, we're going to just, everybody's going to make a puzzle piece. You make your own, design it yourself. And then at the end, we're going to put our puzzle pieces together. Um, if we didn't have anybody telling us how to do it, uh, if we didn't have some sort of a pattern or anything, uh, what is the likelihood of our success? You know, we, we couldn't do that. I've even heard people say, why don't you take about uh, 40, you know, exquisite, you know, artists, and they go into a room, and they, uh, they can each, each of them can paint the Mona Lisa by themselves. They can replicate that. Uh, to a T, you take them into a room and say, all right, each of you are going to go into this room one at a time, and you're going to each paint the Mona Lisa, uh, but you're not going to get to see what the other person has done. And so you're going to walk into this dark room, and you're going you're to put your stroke on, on that uh, 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 you know, painting. You're going to do that, and everybody's going to come in. They're going to do their part, and at the end, you know, what do you think the end result's going to be? You know, you've got to be able to see what others have done. And um, that's the beauty of this is that in all this writing and all the prophecies and all that, you know, they didn't, they couldn't see everything. They didn't understand everything that was going on. You know, think about Moses when he struck the rock. You know, we're not going to find out until a few chapters away of why that that was such a big deal. You know, you, you think about things uh, that uh, had happened in the Old Testament. They didn't know everything that they were doing, uh, but they knew that they were supposed to follow God. We're supposed to follow God too. We're supposed to do that, and so we, uh, we, we follow God, but we have a better picture of things because you know all these people throughout time had done their part, had proclaimed what they were supposed to proclaim, had said what God had wanted them to say, and now it's all written out for us, and we have it uh, complete. And so, you know, that's uh, this idea of the, you know, you know, God has spoken uh, in sundry times, you know, little little sections at a time, uh, many many parts. And so, God gave His revelation in many parts, and and uh, you know, the Bible didn't just all kind of fall together one day. It took you know a long, you know, hundreds of years and thousands, you know, or even. Uh, to really lay out what had happened uh, throughout the history of, of man. Um, before we move on to the next part, anybody have any comments there? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes, yes. Which is interesting, and, and to repeat, just in case someone couldn't hear, um, you know, Brother Philip was saying that uh, that God has always laid out what he has expected. You know, even from the beginning, you think about, uh, you know, Cain and Abel, and they were offering their sacrifices, one is good and one is not. And we know even from uh, Hebrews chapter 11 of that Abel offered his in faith. And Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 tells us that, you know, uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so he had to have some instruction in order to know what he was doing. And, and sometimes people, they, they look at that and go, oh, you know, poor, poor guy, he just didn't do it right. No, um, Abel offered with faith. You know, he knew what he was doing because he was doing things based on what he was told to do. Uh, Cain, on the other hand, uh, decided to go a different way. Um, but yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. God, God is definitely from the beginning. He's from, you know, he's he's eternal. Um, you know, I actually watched something the other day where people were discussing the eternality of God, and that's an interesting uh, interesting subject. But yeah, God is from. From the beginning, and uh, made the beginning rather, and uh, and of course God is placed at the beginning of this uh, sentence and has uh, a unity of thought for those uh, who would want to follow Him. If you look uh, at this next big word here, uh, in the diverse manners, uh, it means varied methods and ways, and so. You know, here it is, we, we've talked about already, sometimes, you know, you have people like Moses that, uh, you know, God spoke directly to them, right? Um, that, that was not what happened with everybody. You know, some people uh, were, were given uh, dreams and visions, and they, they were able to go and to, uh, uh, to basically proclaim the things that they saw uh, therein. But, um, you know, he says, he says look, they... There's, there's varied, varied ways, varied methods uh, that uh, God used. I've, I've got several down here if you want to add these to your notes. Um, God used many different ways uh, to reveal his will. Uh, you think back to an early version here in Exodus chapter 3. Uh, he used the burning bush uh, to express his will. Uh, and uh, uh, you think about uh, uh, Judges uh, 6 and verse 37. Uh, by using symbols, um, in Second Samuel, uh, verse or chapter twenty-three and verse two, uh, used um, uh, inspiration. Uh, in First Samuel twenty-eight and verse six, he used the Urim and Thummim. Uh, used uh, that as a way uh, to uh, reveal his will. Uh, this happens a lot, but in Joel chapter two and verse twenty-eight, not the only time, but uh, you see. You see dreams. Uh, we, we know that. I think that one's probably the first one that we latch on to uh, as kids, right? Because, you know, who do we think about when we think about someone getting God's will through dreams? Uh, I, I can't help but think about Joseph. Uh, you know, Joseph was able to interpret the, the dreams. Um, later on, we see Daniel doing the same thing. Um, and so he's, he's able to, uh, to interpret and so that people get dreams and uh, Daniel chapter 7, we see visions. Uh, also in 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 8, we have, you know, auditory, uh, uh, an audible voice uh, being able to tell these people what they're to do. But it says, God, who at sundry times in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now, when we think about fathers, um, you know, we, we think of, uh, you know, a lot of times we initially think of our own fathers, uh, but that's not, when we're thinking like a Jew, that's not really, you're talking about ancestry. Uh, you're talking about men of old, uh, the Jewish fathers. Uh, what was that? The yeah, the patriarchs, yeah. So, you know, all these people that had gone on before, you know, Abraham, um, and sometimes the very specific Abraham to Malachi, but... Um, but anyway, all these people that have gone on before, that, that's a kind of a broad 
uh, a broad sense. It's not very specific, but it's it's uh, those um, patriarchs that had gone on before, uh, on into uh, on into the um, uh, basically these uh, old older men of renown and ancient in the faith that that we know of um, that would go on past past those patriarchs. Uh, but uh, the the book, of course, was written to the Hebrews, and and um, and the, this is this is for everybody. And, it's, and it says, you know, like it, it's saying right here, you know, he's, he's spoken in times past unto the Father. So all those people that have gone on before you, he spoke to them by the prophets. And when we think about prophets, I think when all the times, oftentimes we think about, you know, the uh, uh, prophetic books and, and those prophets. Uh, sometimes a prophet is uh, used in a little more broader sense, and that being a spokesman. Uh, for God, um, uh, sometimes even related to kind of like a preacher. Uh, some some prophets were uh, able to uh, be able to foretell the future uh, because of something God had told them. Uh, but a prophet uh, is uh, a spokesperson uh, for another. In Luke chapter 11 and verse 50, Abel is uh, called a prophet. And uh, the, the law and prophets pointed to, to whom? Well, that all pointed to Christ in Luke chapter 24 and verse 44. And uh, if you think about this, this is an interesting concept because if you are an honest Jew during this time, an honest Jew studies the Old Testament scriptures, which according to Galatians chapter 3 is bringing you where? It's bringing you to the New Testament. An honest Jew looks at the Old Testament and sees Jesus, finally says, okay, all right, I'm, I get this now. I, I see this. Uh, but, um, you know, honest Jews would, uh, would not uh, uh, fail to receive Christ because they would have understood the 333 or so uh, Old Testament prophecies concerning Christ and would have uh, been easily able to see their fulfillment. Um. You know, you think about a lot of things here. You know, God has spoken unto man, and he is, has done this in many ways, uh, but he does this uh, in the beginning by the prophets. And he has spoken unto us today, of course, uh, according to Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, we have his divine will. And so God is the author of the Old Testament and the New Testament, and therefore... Uh, we need to, like we see in Jeremiah 22 and verse 29, we need to hear the word of the Lord. And God, of course, is the author, uh, and so we need to listen to him. And I uh, suppose, you know, think about this, what would have happened if God had not spoken to man? Uh, we, we just wouldn't, would not have known what to do at all. Uh, there would be no way of knowing. God, uh, we... we and, and really, that's, that's kind of how the religious world operates today. They act like there is no real revelation. There is no real understanding of the scriptures. And because of that, I cannot know what I need to do. But, of course, that contradicts what we see in the Bible. God has spoken, and therefore we obey. But yet, of course, so many uh, will refuse to do that. They want to do uh, their own thing. Um, we're, we're kind of, man, we're not nearly as far as I thought we'd be. But see, that's how, that's how the New Testament goes with me. I'm sorry about that. Actually, I'm not sorry about that. I enjoy digging deep. I don't know about you guys. Verse 2, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So, there's some major things of course again in this this passage it says hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son uh, question what does last days mean what does last days mean um, you know we I, I won't put you on the spot too much there if you got an answer I'll be glad to take it but the last days uh, has uh, and I really didn't realize this until a few months ago, 
But uh, the first part, I think we all pretty much get, last days is the Christian, uh, Christian dispensation. But it, for the Jew, it's actually a little more uh, pointed than that because the Jew would have looked at the idea of the last days and that it would mean that it referred to the time when the Messiah was here, when the Messiah came to the earth. And, um, and uh, so all this, the last days, would begin with the coming of the Messiah. And so, yeah, yeah, it is the Christian dispensation. But, of course, the Christian dispensation, uh, when you think about it, begins after Christ's death. Uh, but when you think about the last days as a Jew, you're thinking what? You're thinking the Messiah has come. And so that, that is the beginning of these last days. Uh, so the Messiah has come. And, and now, now it says, see, see the importance of the ending of that thought, is that the last days spoken unto us by whom? His Son. Now, uh, I, I, had, I had a lot of things I wanted to cover right here. Um, I'm going to just give these off to you if you want to write these down. Um, thinking about the, uh, the new age that is the Christian age, here are some verses that go along with that. Uh, I had wanted to actually go through and read them, but uh, we spent half an hour on verse 1. So, um, In Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 6 through 17, Acts 2, 6 through 17, and also Joel 2, 28 through 30. Joel 2, 28 through 30. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1. 1 Timothy 4, 1. And then 2 Timothy 3, 1. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. James 5, 3. Again, James 5, 3. 1 Peter 1 and verse 20. 1 Peter 1, 20. 2 Peter 3 and verse 3. And then last, Jude 18. Now, I want to, while we're, we're thinking about this idea here with the Son and uh, thinking about, you know, the Messiah at the same time, um, when you think of, you know, a son and you know in our society uh children and, and of course too i want to make sure that we all understand this uh the bible is clear that all children are a blessing you know and so that's that's very clear but um the importance of boys and having sons uh went a long way i mean if you think about it today uh you want to have sons they'll be able to help help out, you know, take care of things. I know uh, that uh, I have watched uh, se several older people that in their later years, uh, they have to rely on their sons, and if they don't have sons, they rely on sons-in-law to come and do things at the house and take care of things uh, when they get uh, up in years. Uh, but if you think about a son during the, uh, the time of Christ, um, a son is a very important thing. Uh, they they didn't have uh, they didn't have any stimulus money coming to them. You know they didn't have welfare checks, food stamps, and those things. Um, they didn't have that kind of thing. And so what you needed is uh, you needed somebody to take care of you, and you needed a son. You needed somebody uh, that could um, uh, that that when you get up in years, that there's somebody there for you. Um, Thinking about that, that's kind of a logistical thing. Uh, but as far as sons were concerned, uh, sons, and especially your oldest son, uh, was put on much of a pedestal when it came to uh, when it came to Jewish society. Uh, you know, to a Jew, the son was really equal to the father, and uh, we can we can see that in, in uh, John chapter five and verse eighteen. Uh, but, you know, here he is, he's making a very big statement here. You know, here, here you have the son, and the son is, is uh, equal to the father. Now, that should bring 
some things to mind for us. Uh, when you think about uh, some of the things that we, we uh, read about in, in the uh, New Testament, uh, of course, you, you think about, I think number one when I think about this, in uh, Matthew 21 and verse 37, that's the, that's the parable where you have um, uh, the, uh, the vineyard that has been overtaken and, and the owner of the vineyard is sending servants and they just beat them and they kill them and they, they're, they're, they're just harming these people. And then he says, well, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send my son. Now, to us in an American society where, you know, we're, we're not putting as much value probably on a son as they did back then, and uh, him being equal to the father, if he had, if they had sent to the son, it means more than. Uh, that is going to be much different than it comes when it comes to God, right? Uh, the prophet is going to, you know, it means a lot, but it means more when you have the son. And so looking at this uh, through Jewish eyes, you see uh, the importance here, the superiority of Christ already coming through. And, uh, and, and it's, uh, man, I, I tell you what, it's an interesting thing. Yeah. Yeah, I said, uh, yeah, half in these, you know, he's talking about, it says half in these last days, you know, he's spoken the last days, which is, these are the last days, you know, now he's spoken unto us by his son, yeah, you know, he's, yeah, he's, he's already spoken, you know, for one, you know, he's lived, lived, uh, you know, and I actually have some things in here that we're not going to be able to get to, uh, but you think about, uh, you know, John 1 and uh, verse 1, and what does it say, in the beginning was the word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, you know, God, you know, Christ was in the beginning. He was the Word, and, and everything in, that was made in the beginning was made with Him. And so, yeah, it's, it's very important to realize that, yeah, you know, it, it, and, and two, um, it shows a finality too, right? Um, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a phrase going around. I haven't really watched this, you know, but... Uh, you know, everybody's talking about this um, Star Wars uh, show, The Mandalorian, and there's some guy in there, and he says, I have spoken. And, uh, you know, there have been times in life, I remember, I remember trying to convince my parents of something growing up, and they said, nope, we have spoken. Uh, and there's a finality to that, right? You know, nope, that's it. And so, yeah, Christ, uh, you know, God has spoken uh, unto us, now in these last days uh, through his son. Now, I want to uh, mention we're running out of time, but it says he's appointed heir of all things. Um, now, I've got several things written down here uh, that uh, uh, actually, i tell you, this is a good reference. I, I got these uh, straight from uh, the uh, World Video Bible School uh, lecture on uh, the beginning of Hebrews here. But uh, when you think about uh, being the heir of all things, what what has Jesus, uh, you know, what 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 does he have? What is he inheriting here? Well, according to Matthew chapter twenty eight and verse eighteen, uh, he has all power. In uh, Daniel seven, uh, verses thirteen and fourteen, he's got everlasting glory, uh, an everlasting dominion and kingdom. Matthew eleven. In verse 27, he is the heir of all things. In Luke 1, and verse 32, uh, he has the throne of David. In John 3, and verse 35, again, all things. John 5, 22, uh, he's got all judgment. All judgment is under Christ. Uh, John 13, and verse 3, uh, again, all things. John 17, and verse 2, uh, you know, he's, he's um, you know, over... Uh, He's the authority over all mankind. Uh, Romans 1 and verse 4, 
Uh, he is the Son of God with power. Uh, you think about uh, Romans 8, uh, or actually here, let's see here, Romans 14 and verse 9. Uh, he is the Lord of the living and the dead. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 27, he is, uh, of course, all things uh, are subject to him. In Ephesians 1 and verses 10 and 21, he is above uh, all. Um, you know, he has all rule and power and dominion. Uh, Philippians 2 verses 9 and 10, uh, his name is above all names. And uh, yeah, if you go through that whole list, I know that was, uh, that's not even exhaustive, I know, but you go through that whole list of things, and how, you think about all those things, how can you receive all of that? How can you be uh, an heir if you aren't the son? You know, sometimes people like to say, you know, Jesus, no, no, Jesus is not the son of God, you know, he, they... They, they try to uh, try to take that away, uh, but you know what? He is the heir of all things. He has been given everything. I guess we're going to have to stop right there. Um, well, I guess we'll kind of pick up at the end of that. Anybody have any comments or questions as we close out? All right. Well, we'll just start here at the end. A verse 2 next time.